Okay, so uh, my name is Daniel Tiger. This presentation is about creating photorealistic procedural materials in Substance Designer. Okay. Well, first, a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm originally from Sweden. I uh, started my career at DICE in Stockholm back in 2005. I worked on a few Battlefield games, and currently I work at Bungie, where my team and I uh, create props, architecture materials for the Bungie environment art team to use when they create the Worlds of Destiny. Uh, I specialize in shaders, materials, and uh, R&D, as well as a fair amount of content management. Uh, let's see, these are a few games I've been part of uh, over the years. Uh, so personally, I'm always interested in learning new tools and workflows. It's an uh, important uh, part of my role at Bungie to stay up to date. And having tried many different w ways of generating textures in the past, I really loved, you know, digging into Substance Designer where you can work in this highly iterative and non-destructive way. Uh, since most of my career has been focused on creating natural materials, those were the materials I started exploring. And here's just some examples of my portfolio. Uh, all the materials in this whole presentation are 100% substance designer without using any other piece of software. In creating anything photorealistic, it's all about the reference use. Photos are still my main source of reference for any project. But today with easy access to so many great uh, 3D scan or photogrammetry libraries, it's uh, a great uh, opportunity to use them as a deeper source of reference. And the images we're looking at here are from uh, textures.com 3D scan library. Uh, Personally, I use, you know, like you can analyze the height and normals for nuances in shape that are not visible when you're uh, looking at the material. Like you can really like zoom into small details. And for uh, uh, diffuse, you can really, you know, analyze what it really looks like without the distractions uh, of the light information. And 3D scans are almost uh, impossible to match procedurally, but for me, it's been an interesting challenge to see how close I can get with a fully procedural workflow. So we're gonna go into just a little side-by-side -side where I, I try to build just alongside uh, this data, just analyzing uh, height and normals and diffuse and just build alongside it. So to your right is the procedural version. And you can see some stuff clearly doesn't match, but uh, it's fairly close in most cases. And same for the albedo, really like looking at all the details where dirt accumulate and try to mimic using procedural methods. And this is diffuse lighting, just gray diffuse with, uh, uh, with AO. And here's the final composite. And since I was using the Photogrammetry as reference, I was able to get pretty close in a reasonable amount of time. I think this material took me around 10, 15 hours. And, you know, it's possible to get even closer by investing more time, but uh, I'm pretty happy with this result. 
And the benefit at this point over the 3D scan when you have this procedure material is that you can generate infinite variations. And here's another example of me trying to match a 3D scan. This is Quixel Megascans uh, 3D scan uh, from their asset library. And I'm trying to just make, see what I can do uh, in substance, creating something similar. And it's really about analyzing the reference. So this is sort of my attempt. This is a tiling texture, but it doesn't really work that well because it has a huge log that just repeats forever. But it was just a fun experiment to try to build alongside it. So this is the agenda of this talk. We're going to talk about the signature series project I did for Algorithmic and just step through the development process on my side. And we're going to step through a graph and show you guys how it's set up. And I have a section about maximizing your output, how you can use Designer to uh, uh, just boost uh, your productivity. And I get a lot of questions about how I learned Substance Designer, so I'm going to just step through those in the last two sections. So late, late last year, I was approached by Algorithmic to create materials for their online materials library called Substance Source. I created 15 materials for three visually distinct biomes, each of which uh, consists of five materials. And these are my biome selection. So I have one for desert, one Icelandic biome, and one jungle. And I decided to pick these visually distinct biomes and within the materials that I hadn't explored much in the past, so I can use it as a you know, personal boost and uh, a skill up type thing. So next we'll just look at how I planned and executed this work. So in figuring out what I wanted to do, I started collecting huge amounts of reference images. It's one of the most important steps to figure out what you're actually doing and to get inspired. I use this program that I'm sure uh, many of you are uh, familiar with. It's called Pure Ref. You can easily create uh, reference boards and you can have them shared on the network. And these are some examples of boards I created for this specific project. Some are of the biome as a whole and some are of specific materials. But it's, it's really a really nice program because it's uh, floating on the screen and uh, you can zoom in and out. And it's available for download for a donation on their website. So once you have a lot of reference or too much of it, it's time to kind of decide uh, what you're going to build. So. I knew I was just making materials for this online library, but I wanted them to belong in a scene, so if people wanted to use them, they can combine them in, uh, in an environment. So I used the same method. I, I used a work, uh, you know, you, you break down a scene, like this was a scene uh, that we're looking at that I would like to be able to build with my jungle materials. And I'm looking for materials that kind of capture the essence of the scene. Uh, and also offer like uh, diversity in terms of frequency of detail. They can't, can't all be super detailed. If you try to combine that, like you can't really like play in that environment. Uh, offer a balance of eye rest and visual interest and flexi flexible materials is what you're looking for so the user can combine them in you know, many, uh, many different versions of uh, a jungle scene essentially. So these are my selections, a mud material that you can use for paths or uh, around huts or whatever. Uh, a roots material you can use around big trees or on uh, slopes. Uh, this rocks or riverbed material you can use in wet areas or around cliffs. And grass or ground cover material you can use in clearings in the jungle. And finally, I like a leaves material that you can use under any type of vegetation or uh, trees. I also set up some goals uh, for what I wanted each material to achieve. Uh, so I wanted them to have, be photo rail uh, in, in their quality by closely matching my reference. Uh, I want them to be visually striking. I knew I was making them for a material library, so I know that they're going to be seen in isolation, so I want them to have their own uh, identity. I want them to be unified and 
be cohesive within the biome, uh, biome by using the same colors and values for everything. Uh, similar elements and components, you know, if you're using grass or leaves, that can bridge the family of assets together nicely. And same scale of features, not a leaf that's this big on one texture and then like super tiny on the next. And another big thing was I wanted to include uh, tweakable parameters just to show off the power of Substance Designer over you know, static media libraries where the user can really customize it to his need uh, or uh, a specific scene. And before I started creating uh, any actual substances, I created just a simple plan. Uh, it's just good to know what you're doing. You can share with your collaborators and for yourself as well uh, so you don't lose focus. Uh, I just have a descriptive name and a short description to know what I'm supposed to build. Uh, I include the parameters here, so once I start building my substance, I'm not building in such a way that I eliminate uh, any one of these options. And also the most important part probably is the components. And you see there's a fair amount of overlap there, which means it's going to save me time as well as it's, it's bringing everything together in, in unity. And at, at the bottom, it's just a descriptive image, sort of what the target is. So before going through the breakdown, I just want to uh, explain what my typical flow is when creating a substance. First, like I said before, it's all about the reference. You get familiar with how the material is put together by looking at many different types of images uh, on the same theme. Does it have a directionality or a force to it that you need to pay attention to? Uh, you identify the main shapes, uh, what are the underlying forms, uh, and you find the large striking shapes so you know where you're going to start. And then once you know that, you start layering the shapes the same way you would model with clay or ZBrush. It's all about layering uh, shapes on top of each other. And I can't stress this enough, just focus on height. Don't you know, start mixing in. If you start using albedo or different colors, it kind of takes away from your height information. And also, like, if your height is incorrect, essentially all you build in substance is height. So if your height is inaccurate, it means your normal won't work or your uh, AO will look all weird. And then you create subcomponents like grass and leaves and you combine those with the, uh, your main shape. And finally, you go in and you, you start messing around with your diffuse AO and roughness. So one of my favorite materials that I created for this uh, signature series drop is the roots material. So that's the one we're going to break down. And here I'm just showing you to reiterate uh, uh, the reference board sort of for this material and the little plan we had. And you see the reference shows roots in different contexts, so I'll just, I just wanted to make sure like it's, it can work in a, a few of these different ones as well as it shows off details. Uh, you see in the bottom right there, you see like this zoomed in picture where you can really see how roots kind of twist and turn. So let's look at how we built this. So I start by analyzing the reference. The obvious foundation here is uh, the mud that every, everything is resting upon. Uh, then we have what I call the primary roots, which are these thick shapes that cover the whole surface. And on top of those, I have what I call the secondary roots, which are these that make the real material really interesting. It's like these small, thinner roots that loop in and over and around and twist. So let's look at this a little bit simplified step by step, but if someone sees this later on video or whatever, you, you should be able to create something similar. So here we're looking at the 3D plane. Obviously, like I don't have much height information, so I'm not displaying the height and tessellation on this yet, but I pretty much start with this tile sampler node just to get some directionality. And I'm just using uh, elongated square shapes that I just scatter around, and you see they have different uh, value intensities on them as well. So I run in through a distance uh, node just to create this Voronoi pattern. And it might be hard to uh, see what this is going to generate, but you'll see in a minute. Uh, I just run this through a warp node to just create something a little bit uh, more natural looking. 
And I think in the next slide here, you can start to see like, now we're creating this pattern that, of these primary roots that uh, cover the whole, uh, the base and they divide uh, much like a reference. And with this edge detect node, I can set the thickness and uh, I can soften out the roundness and do that kind of stuff. <coughs> so to get some volume in here, I'm using a bevel node and uh, a little blur node. And then I'm just multiplying my edge detect to on top again. Uh, just, I don't want any blurry values in the transition. I just want sharp edges at, at this point. So these are essentially if inflating the shapes. I create this weird uh, layered noise pattern. I think I'm using two different Perlin noises cross-faded into each other and I'm using a vector warp node. This will kind of create the twisting pattern that sits on top of this. Um, finally there I'm inflating it with a slope blur node. And this is multiplied on top. This looks pretty weird right now, but it will, it will look better later, hopefully. And yeah, like this is overlaid on top of that shape. And I also add some wood fiber detail. I use this fractal sum base node and uh, set to pretty noisy values. And I'm using that inflated shape from before just so my noise will follow these blobby shapes that I have superimposed over my uh, primary roots. And this is the final primary root shape. It looks pretty weird and not that interesting. But I know I'm going to blend the secondary roots and all sorts of, I don't want to say crap, but crap on top of this. <laughs> it's going to make it look better, so don't worry. So here we're going to look at what the secondary roots is doing. Uh, just the node network to the right, I'm just using a paraboloid uh, that I make a little bit skinny and then I direction and blur it, and then I warp it in a couple of different ways and combine it into a, essentially a fork shape. And this is just a little step-by-step -step video. And finally, I scatter it using a tile sampler, which we'll see in the next step. So here's that tile sampler. Essentially, I'm just using that fork shape that I got. I scatter them randomly. I play with the color value intensity, color mask, I think it's called. Yeah, something like that. Just to get different height values, so you see they some kind of loop over each other. And then just random rotations. And here is my primary shapes again. So we're gonna start combining these two shapes together. And at the intersection points, you see the histogram scan node to the bottom left. It's creating this really sharp mask based on the shape from the previous slide. And I'm piping that into a non-uniform blur node, which only blurs where that mask is active. So you see it kind of like, it kills all that detail, but it keeps the lump. So I'm gonna take my secondary roots later and add on top of this, but I'm not gonna carry any of the micro detail up in that shape. I'm just gonna carry the lump over it, essentially. And here I'm just adding them on, on top of this. And the next shape we're going to look at is our mud shape. Essentially, I took two different noises. It doesn't really matter which one. If you're trying to rebuild this, you can just grab some of the noisy ones and combine them. They're just cross-faded together. Uh, I'm using two different non-uniform blur nodes with different settings just to create this random pattern. And then I'm using the cells pattern with a uh, warp node just to make them flow over the shapes a little bit better. And this is our you know, final mud shape. It's not the star of the show or anything, it's just sitting on, uh, below everything else. <clears throat> yeah, I create another set of uh, additional roots, like a tiny roots, and I just want them to be layered. So I want mud and these tiny roots, and then I want my big roots, just to like, uh, whatever small thin roots that comes off the main ones, essentially. So in the little node uh, in the corner there, you can see uh, I have my secondary roots as the mask for where I want these to show up. So I want them to sit on below where my uh, secondary roots were. And these are then combined uh, with the mud using the same techniques as I used when I combined the, the roots together. 
And here I combine my, uh, my main shape with my uh, roots using the height blend node. And this is a really cool node. You can set where you want the height intersection point to be so you can dig stuff in or you can bring them out. And what I'm noticing at this point is that the mud areas are pretty flat compared to my reference. Uh, so I'm gonna create a little bit of volume for those. So from this height blend node, uh, it gets a mask, which is the intersection point between the two previous inputs. And I'm just running a little bevel on that to angle that shape a little bit, and I blur it, and I just multiply it on top. And if I step back and forward, you can see that we created these kind of like little pits on there. And next, we're gonna just look at some of the components I made. I just made these small animations. So this is the leaf component. And I'm just showing the normal at the end. For, for me, it's easier to grasp what, what it's doing. And then the grass. Same here, like very simple shapes. There are great substance artists around that made you know, super advanced versions of these, but these are just like additive elements uh, on this material, so they don't need to be uh, taking over. And these are then scattered using two separate towel samplers. So the leaves one, uh, you, you can see that it sits sort of where the mud is supposed to be flat, so it's using that as a mask. And then the grass, it's hugging the roots, so I'm using like an AO, an AO node from the roots themselves uh, to get like the little gradient alongside the roots, and then I subtract the roots from that, so I get just that mask around where they, where they are. And the, this is just everything combined. So this is our final composite shape. And you can see the primer roots that looked a little bit weird before. It's kind of hidden by everything else. Uh, and so to summarize what we did here, we created our primary and secondary roots. We combined them all. We created this mud shape. Uh, we created leaves and grass separately, and we combined it with our main shape. And everything is just combined layer by layer. And next we'll look at how I built the albedo for this material. But before looking at the actual nodes, we'll just uh, look back with our reference and to just know what we're doing again. So we're gonna create a mud layer. We're gonna create the color layer for the roots and the roots in my reference. I noticed there's a bunch of algae and uh, lichen on there, so we're gonna create that separately. And then we have the leaves and also the grass. And same here, these will be combined uh, layer by layer the same way we combined our shapes, essentially. So this is our mud. Very simple. The mud is not the star of the show. Uh, it's, it's there to offer eye rest. Everything else is very noisy in here. So I think I'm using just the mud base shape in the auto levels, and I'm just adding an AO node just to capture the crevices. And then I'm using very soft colors here as well. Uh, Nothing super detailed. And the roots. I'm just using my, the whole shape, the combined uh, composite shape from before, and I'm piping it through this gradient map. By the way, all these colors that you see here in this little gradient are captured uh, with the gradient map tool from our reference photos. And if you have, uh, 3D scans or photogrammetry available, use that to grab your values so you know they're you know, kosher. And there's the lichen. So I'm using this grunge map here, uh, which has a feature on it that you can set a little edge fade on it. And then I use a tile generator just to scatter out a bunch of those. And then I'm creating this difference mask where I use my a mask from my primary and secondary roots that I combined, so I get two different uh, grayscale values for those two. And those are then piped into this directional warp node, which means my lichen pattern grunge map here is, is gonna be offset based on the layer it sits on. So I don't get lichen that looks like it's just smeared on top. I get actually different patterns based on what uh, level of roots you're looking at. And then I'm just blending it together with uh, uh, the color from the previous slide. And these are my lichen colors, also grabbed from our reference photos. 
And in some of these values, you, uh, these color values I set in alpha so I don't stomp whatever comes in from the other one. And here I just combine based on our masks that we have at hand, uh, just the mud and the roots. I follow the same steps and just create color and uh, albedo values for the leaves and the grass. And this starts looking like something. It looks very binary, obviously, at this point. So the next step, we're going to have a look at how to eliminate that. And here, everything kind of starts coming together. So I have this uh, coating of dust. I'm using this convenient dust node on here. Uh, it's included in base substance. Essentially, I'm just piping in the, you see the gray connection down at the bottom. Uh, I'm just piping in the AO in there. And you can set contrast levels and uh, like a little bit of graininess. You see it has a yellow input on the dust node as well, which means you can pipe in your normal if you want some directionality. But since this is a ground material, I want, I want it to be omnidirectional with the dust. As for the colors, I'm just using a fractal sum and really soft values here. This is like a softening agent that's meant to bind the texture together, not introduce its own level of noise that kind of takes away from the composition. And the final step is I blend on some curvature on the end. It just tucks in the shapes. Uh, probably some PBR fanatics will scream or throw tomatoes at me for this, but it just makes it uh, sing a little bit better. And I'm using the curvature smooth on here for that. And this is our final uh, albedo. And now you can see actually the roots that the lichen pattern, these uh, white marks are offset based on sort of the primary roots has a different pattern. I don't know if my mouse is working on that screen. Yeah, you can see uh, here, this root has a different pattern than the one below. It would, it would look kind of weird if this pattern was just smeared below. And the roughness values are grabbed from photogrammetry at all these stages. AO. I didn't cover that in the breakdown. Uh, the only thing I'm doing special in this AO, it's basically just a default AO node that's included. But the leaves, I wanted them to appear like they have some volume to them. Uh, so I had a separate uh, AO using the masks of the leaves just to, you see they have a little more of a drop shadow that's, that's kind of implying that they're like super tall or whatever. And there's the normal. And this is the final render. And this is another render with some of the parameters enabled. <clears throat> and as I mentioned previously, adding tweakable parameters was a huge part of this project. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and this is one of my favorite and the most powerful aspects of creating materials in Designer. Not only can you, you know, achieve great looking results that you know, rivals sometimes even you know, ZBrush materials, but you can also make them interactive for the user. So you can cater them to whatever scene or a specific need they might have. So when I drafted up my plans for the materials, I included a section for what parameters I wanted tweakable. Just to know beforehand, I didn't build my graph in a way where I eliminated those aspects. And uh, creating tweakable parameters in Substance is very easy. Essentially, you just find the parameter you want tweakable and you just hit expose, and that's all you need to do. There's more to it as well if you, you can take it as deep as you want, but this is essentially like what you need to do. And let's have a look at some of the parameters I have exposed for this material. So this split sphere kind of shows some parameter extremes. Um, I created this roots amount that, if you remember from the breakdown, I have two different tile samplers controlling uh, the density. So I have this one value that's driving both of those, so I can reduce the amount. I use this water lemon load that's uh, included in uh, default substance. Uh, it's a really cool node. You can set how murky you want the water or how much uh, you can see of the underlying forms. You also have like wetness edges, uh, how, much the, uh, how much it smooths out the materials and darkens it close to water. 
and essentially I just expose the water level value. It's just a height value. And finally, I have leaves density. I, I use the tile sampler to scatter my leaves, and I'm just hooking this up to uh, the parameters that controls the, how dense the leaves are. And this is another material from the jungle biome. This is a grass, the ground cover grass material. And you see I have a couple more uh, tweakable parameters here. I have the dead leaf amount, which is the stuff that you can kind of see in the water, and it's actually trapped under the grass itself as well. I have the grass amount, which is the top half is probably like 20% or something, and the bottom is 100%. Uh, lush leaf amount is these small green leaves that grow on top of the grass, and puddling, puddling amount is yeah, self-explanatory. And then I have this dust amount where you know, if the rain hits the material, it kicks up this dust that covers everything and kind of makes it uh, a little bit uh, cloudy. And this is just a short video of me tweaking the parameters in Substance Painter uh, on these two materials. Whoops. Let's try again. There we go. You can see the water level and some leaf amount, and then it's just some random seeding. And same here, puddling amount, uh, leaves amount, and grass amount. So without building the graph in a very special way, I could just expose these parameters, and we can create a lot of different results uh, with just one procedural material. These are all the materials from that jungle biome with the parameter extremes. Uh, you can see the, the one to the, to the left uh, is some kind of uh, leaves uh, material that leaves are supposed to kind of decompose when it uh, puddles around. And you have this mud material also with water. Water is kind of like the one that, thing that binds these materials together as well as the sort of dead leaves. And the one to the far right, the riverbed material, is you can define how much uh, dead leaves you want accumulated between uh, the rocks and also have some kind of weird algae thing that grows and you can set the direction you want on that. And these are the desert materials. I have options for two different kinds of desert color, whatever, red desert, like Nevada style and the yellow type and Sahara or whatever. And also features like a bunch of rocks in here where you can set kind of like erosion level or how much sand erosion uh, there is. And the grass has kind of sliders for grass amount and stuff. And these are the Icelandic materials. <coughs> uh, options for snow, like on the one, uh, the, the mossy, lumpy thing. You can set snow amount and also like ratio between like rock and uh, moss. And the cliff, you have grass amounts and that kind of stuff, and the beach water level, and it also has like this kind of disgusting water foam that you can see on beaches sometimes that you don't want to touch with your feet. And then you have this snow uh, where you can set the melt level so you can have a snowy field or you can just melt it down to slush. And the last one, I didn't include any parameters, but you can random seed and create as many variations as you want. So when working through a project of this size with so many different uh, materials, uh, having a consistent quality is extremely important. You know, to make any game look good, you can't have a varying degree of quality. You know, if you run through any scene and you see like a high-res texture on the ground next to a low-res one or like a worse quality one or a 3D scan next to a procedural, like it's important to have high consistent quality so I divided my work into uh, six different phases. So I have this iterative approach when I produce any art, uh, anything from a single shade or a texture to 3D models or whole levels. Uh, I don't like doing double work, you know, when taking something to 100% and then it has to change for whatever reason. So I adopted this mindset to save time and my own sanity. Uh, each gate allows for plenty of feedback from collaborators or, you know, if you work in a game studio, art directors and all that. The primary goal of this is uh, to ensure everything has a consistent high quality. And the secondary goal is to save time and use time as efficiently as possible. 
So in this initial setup is you test your ideas, uh, find what works and what doesn't work. Uh, if stuff needs to change here, you haven't done a lot of work, so you can just trash that. In this first pass, you have kind of established the materials uh, you're going to work on, and you iterate through, constantly raising the low bar. You know, like every, every day I work on a different material, and I try to raise everything up to the same level. And I try to hit this kind of subjective 70% art quality bar. So I purposefully don't want to finish anything at this point, because I know I need to work through so many materials, and I'm going to learn so many lessons along the way. And in substance, I'm going to create so many different small components that I can funnel back into the process and speed up my workflow and the quality. Uh, I have this test render pass. If you work in a game studio, you know you, you test it in the game. You can check for scale issues. Uh, for me, I was rendering everything in Marmoset, so I, you know some issues you can't really see in substance, but you can really see them clearly when you try to render your stuff. And obviously, this project had a lot of uh, focus on the parameters. I have this whole phase where I set everything up and I organize my graph and I make sure like everything uh, works. And the second pass is where I take everything to final quality. Same thing there, I, I iterate through uh, daily, try to find what, what is the material I don't like today that doesn't have the quality of all the other ones. And then it's just, uh, Perf optimizations and final tweak at the final phase. So here's a video of all the materials I created for this project. With some nice yoga music. That kind of concludes that project. So I'm going to switch gears and talk about how you can maximize your output using Designer, or how I maximize my output, rather. So working in the game industry for a few years, I've developed this mindset, or you can call it brain damage, too, uh, where I always think about how I can scale uh, whatever I'm working on. Like, what if I need 100 versions of whatever I'm working on? So instead of creating you know, single one-off materials, you can create generators. And by generator, I mean it's a regular substance file with tons of exposed parameters, so you can customize it. And this is an example generator that I've made. So this is a tire pattern generator on the tire itself. And then there's the brake disk and uh, the block thing generator and the rim generator uh, in the center. And these are just rendered in Marmoset on, obviously, the, it's a cylinder shape for the tire itself, but the rim itself is just uh, tessellation on a plane. Uh, I made this as a rapid prototyping tool for rims, uh, so I can try many different uh, shapes or uh, designs and iterate really quickly without doing any modeling whatsoever, but just hit, hitting export from Substance Player, essentially. 
And I'm using an alpha just to mask out the unwanted details that I want. And you can pick different you know, shape designs. There's hexagons, the tile in many different ways. There's spokes. And there's a secondary spoke uh, as well. You can set colors for each layer. You can set the wear level. A different hexagon style. I also made available uh, that you can, when using the, uh, the generator in the Substance Player, you can input your own file inputs. And here I'm using the, the Substance logo as an input. And I think Sebastian, the guy, should make these for his uh, Ferrari or Fiat or whatever he's driving. <laughs> also, in a game and studio environment, uh, you can allow, by ex exporting these, file, these generators as SBSR, you can allow more people to contribute to the art process, even if they don't have access to designer licenses. Uh, you, you open it in Substance Player, which is free. So you can really use uh, more staff to help the art creation process. And here's just a little video of me t using this generator. And I'm not on speed, it's like just speed it up. Yeah, you can tweak the logos as well on here. It's like a Ferrari logo. And you can tweak the bolts. BMW for all Germans in the audience. Uh, here's another example of a personal project I'm working on. So I'm working on this little side project with a few friends of mine outside work. It's a turn-based uh, strategy game in a World War II setting using Unity. And for this specific task, I, I needed four medals per team. So it's like a win. You, you won the game, and there's a gold, silver, bronze tier. And also there's a you lost the game type medal. And you know, eight medals isn't a lot. I could pretty much probably brute force and create them all manually. But I, I had my brain damage from before, so I decided to make a generator instead. So I could, you know, if I want to add five more teams, like for this project, I'm, it's the Soviet Red Army versus the Germans. Uh, but if I want to add allies or J Japan or something later, I could just use the same generator. Uh, and here's the generator. Or here's a little video showing what the generator is doing kind of behind the scenes. It's layering this, uh, the shapes that you see to the left, kind of layer by layer. And it's the final render in Marmoset. I remember doing this kind of stuff at, when I worked at DICE. It's, it's not a t super time consuming process, but it takes maybe one day to make w uh, a couple of medals, one day each, and then you know, the next ones are faster or whatever. But with a generator like this, you can generate maybe 100 a day if you need it. And then the art director can pick. So these are just some more examples of uh, medals generated and just rendered in Marmoset, displacing a flat plane. And with Marmoset and Alpha on the render, you, uh, you have like ready-made uh, art assets for your UI. Uh, this one is a little bit special. Uh, I just loaded one of my high-poly tanks in ZBrush and did a Z-grab and just loaded it as a shape. And here are some of the Soviet medals. And here are some of the, you lost the game, and it's, uh, the medals just destroyed for you. The Germans. So teaching myself substance designer, here's just some quick lessons that I picked up along the way. Uh, you've seen this one before, just focus on your height. It's the most important thing you're doing in designer. If it's not accurate, uh, it will have effects down the line. Your AO and normal might not look as you want it to. So I, I use this little base setup when I create any new substance. I'm just piping my shape through a blend node that's just adding some AO and a normal. 
and I'm using just a single color to control my uh, uh, diffuse and roughness, which means I can, I can make it darker and shinier so I can look for uh, stuff there, but essentially just I keep it uh, base gray. Just lets me focus on the shapes. Uh, don't over warp shapes. Like I see a lot of people working on substance and that has all these warp nodes, but if you warp too much, it's gonna destroy whatever you were trying to warp in the first place. So be wary of that. Uh, this is something I use. I try to solve problems procedurally. Uh, again, you can see examples of people trying to build something and they use you know, 10, 20, 30 uh, placement nodes, the, what's it called, transform nodes. And if I'm doing that personally, I know I'm barking up the wrong tree. I, I need to switch gears. I need to find a method where essentially if, you're, if you have boulders or something scattered out and you want pebbles around them, try to find like maybe there's an AO node you can use to scatter the pebbles around. So when you change the amount of boulders, you get pebbles around those and you don't have to pay attention to 20, 30, 40 uh, placement nodes. Uh, incremental saves. Uh, for me, it's kind of janky to like save the whole substance as something else. It kind of takes you out of the flow. So personally, I'm just using this, this is just a little video. It's not showing anything exciting at all, but essentially I'm just taking whatever I'm working on, I'm copying it and pasting it into the same file. Just to, then I can have, you know, 30 versions or whatever. If I'm, sometimes you made something that looks really nice and then you test something and then it's like, shit, I fucked it up and then like, how am I supposed to get this back? And, you know, I usually have a carry a long list here. And this, just find, if you find yourself doing stuff over and over and over, uh, just turn them into a node. You saw, if you saw Ben Wilson's uh, talk before, some great examples of uh, that. And keep your graphs organized, not only for yourself. If you're working with collaborators, it's good that they know what, what you're doing, but sometimes you make something that looks nice and you have to come back a week or a month later and it's like, what, am I, what did I do here? You have no idea what's going on. So you can use the groupings and uh, in this example here, like just imagine this, these nodes, this is part of a huge network that's spanning multiple screens. So sometimes I just collapse the nodes together just to make it more readable. Instead of having four connections, we now have, you know, uh, or three connections in this case, we have one. So it just makes it more readable to look at. And I also get a lot of questions how to become more proficient than designer. And as a general rule, just try to keep problem solving within Designer if you're trying to learn it. You know, if you're trying to learn Maya, you don't go into Max and like model something there and bring it in, like you didn't learn anything at all. So the same here, like don't go to ZBrush and I'm just gonna make a little rock here and then bring it in, you didn't learn anything. Uh, reference, always use reference for everything. Uh, Analyze it and learn how stuff is put together and try to mimic it. Try to find the layer order of, you know, what, how stuff might have been put together in the first place. Practice, you know, keep practicing. It, stuff takes time. Uh, you know, if you're new to the program, it won't look good the first time, but just keep going at it and uh, you'll get there eventually. There's no shortcuts, it just takes time. Uh, Create different types of materials. Once you get a little more proficient, like that's why I had the bricks on here. Like, don't keep making the same brick or make them more damaged or whatever. Like, try something weird, uh, something organic, or uh, you know, people make fish and eggs and all sorts of weird stuff. So you get exposed to different nodes and uh, different things. Same here. Watch tutorials. People ask me like, "What is?" I don't want to get that question later. What is the one tutorial I should watch? When I started, I just watched as many as I could daily. Sometimes I'm not even interested in what they're making, but uh, watching a tutorial, you get uh, input into someone's like thought process and how they break down a problem, and it's always something you can pick up. Or maybe he's he or she is using a node uh, in a way you haven't thought of before that you can funnel into your workflow. And experiment, uh, keep experimenting. This fish pile was made by my buddy, Eric Wiley. So you essentially just build this uh, nice looking fish <laughs> and he scattered it around. Uh, like be, be curious, you try new approaches, try new nodes and techniques. 
And personally, experimenting is something I love doing. I, I have tons of folders with weird experiments I've made in Designer. And a lot of the time when I'm trying to make something, I end up making something I didn't know I was making. And these are some ex uh, examples of stuff I've made that look like something else. So these are my sulfur deposit pools. Can't remember what I was making, but this is what the reference looks like. And it, it, looked, it was kind of going that direction. It's like, oh yeah, like why don't I make this? And this is the, the ball for Josh Lynch, where it is. <laughs> and I made these uh, sea and anemones. And this is what a reference looks like. I wasn't sure what I was making here either, but you know, it looked like something like this. And so I tried to cater it in that direction. And same here, it's like cave stalagmites, those weird kind of like uh, shapes you see in caves. This is the reference shot. And here's the sphere. No idea what I was trying to make in the first place when I ended up with a shape like this, but I just kept experimenting and it looked sort of like a cave stalagmite, so that what that project turned out to be. And that's it. I guess we're doing questions. So you need to head over to the mic if you have any. Or everyone's tired and want to go drinking, probably. Hey, Daniel. Uh, thanks for the talk. My question is, uh, how much detail do you put in the materials? Because especially those roots, if you tile them throughout a big uh, space, they're going to look like they're tiled just because yeah. there's so much detail. Do you worry about that or do you just worry about adding decals or something else to break it up afterwards? I think since it is a very noisy material, it's up to the whatever the environment artist using it. I probably wouldn't use it on a big piece of land, you know, because it repeats too much. But if you have a couple of trees close together and you kind of threshold blend it together with mud and stuff around it, it, it works. Okay. The same with, you know, super noisy rocks that you kind of paint around cliffs. You don't paint like a whole field of sure. that. Sure. So it's use it with kind of discretion, I guess, or tweak the roots amount. Thank you. Hey, Daniel, thanks for the talk. Uh, I purchased some of your materials off Gumroad. Um, Thank you. I had a question about uh, how you approach things like subsurface scattering and translucency in your workflow. Um, so with materials like wax or ice or glass or something like that? Uh, usually I'm just messing around in Marmoset and I try to find a setting that works. Uh, you know, the, f the actual physical size of your material matters with the subsurface scattering, so you need to pay attention to uh, you know, what millimeter thickness it has. So world, real life scale is important there. But so you're not generating any maps that you might use for uh, deep levels? Not scattering. specifically for okay. those. I'm just using the default setting. Sometimes I use the height map because, you know, like stuff closer to this top of a layered stack of shapes will have more of the subsurface scattering. Uh, as it goes down in the layer stack, it will have less. Oh. AO is also fairly okay to use, but uh, I'm not an authority on uh, subsurface scattering. It's like do whatever works sort of thing. All right, thanks, man. Yeah, thanks. Hey, thanks for the talk. Uh, how do you, in your uh, thought process and in your work, if you want to get uh, achieve a certain pattern or a certain look, how do you predict that this combination of nodes will end up with the result you want? Or is it a lot of trial and error? Or do you have a way of organizing the nodes or analyzing them? I think it's just practice getting familiar with nodes mm -hmm. uh, in general. I can't give you any kind of shortcut to it. I think uh, when I first started, maybe the first couple of months or whatever, I was just doing whatever because I mm -hmm. didn't know what I was doing. But after maybe a couple of months, I started like, what am I actually doing? What is, why is this working? So you kind of like, you learn what, oh, like that node combined with this gets me this kind of shape. So next time you run into a situation where you're trying to create something, you like, Oh yeah, maybe I can use this trick again, but it's just experimenting essentially. Thank you.
No more questions? Free to go drinking. <laughs> <laughs>